All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Tech Geek webinar series, our endeavor to empower techies. We believe that sharing of knowledge is the key to enhance our skills and grow us as professionals. With this principle in mind, we have initiated a series of webinars conducted by industry experts to give you all a crisp insight of various domains. The topic of today's session is Introduction to In-Memory Data Grids. And our guest speaker today are Pratik Nendikunja, he is the senior member technical staff, and Sharath Reddy, he is the architect with Nest Technologies. Pratik Nelikunja works as a senior member of technical staff at Next Technologies and is a senior developer involved in design and development with cutting edge tools and technologies in the Java and Java EE space with agile software development. He has been responsible for execution of projects involving work in challenging requirements and versatile technologies such as Apache Wicket, Strats, Spring, Hibernate, West, Maven, and SQL. His passion includes listening to retro English music. Sharat Reddy works for Nest Technologies as an architect with over 11 years in the industry. He had an opportunity to work on diverse frameworks built on top of Java and GEE. He has been involved in design and development of various projects involving technologies such as Struts, Spring, Wicket, Velocity, and also has a good amount exposure to QoS aspects such as performance, availability, and scalability. So without further delay, I introduce you all to our guest speakers. Over to you, Sharath and Pratik. Sharath, can you hear us? I think the speakers are not able to hear me. Let me just check what the problem might be. Sharad Pratik, you are not audible. Can you please check your audio settings? Sharad, would you like to redial in? Disconnect the call and can you redial in? Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, Sharath. Pratik, are you also there? Yes, I'm here. All right, so I would request you to carry on the session. Your voice okay, is loud and sure. clear. Yeah, so hi all. Welcome to the webinar on an introduction to uh, in-memory data grids. Uh, 
as introduced already, I am uh, Pratik and I would be presenting uh, this session along with uh, Sharat Reddy. So let's quickly run through the uh, agenda for the session. So firstly, I will briefly touch upon what an IMDG is. Then on, I will look at uh, what the pros and cons about being in memory are and why IMDG. So using the pros and the cons, so what are the capabilities that brings to the table and how we could overcome them with an IMDG solution. After that I would go ahead and uh, list some of the major uh, Java IMDG products available in the market which will help me explain to you the key architectural concepts behind uh, IMDG. Followed by that we'll have a quick demo by Sharat uh, and a comparison with caches as well as uh, NoSQL. Uh, last but not the least, we'll open up the session for Q&A. So what is an IMDG? So the key words here are being in memory and a grid. So basically it's a data structure that resides entirely in the RAM and at the same time it is distributed across multiple uh, servers. Uh, so the in-memory data grid uh, does not uh, access data directly from the disk. So this way it enables higher throughput and uh, lower latency. So what is so good about being in memory? So as we all know, uh, memory is fast in comparison to disk. So how fast? So it's a good 800 times faster than your normal uh, SATA hard disk drive, a good seven times faster than your fastest uh, solid state device. So in terms of transfer rate, uh, a hard disk device can transfer up to 150 MB per second, whereas a solid state device can push it up to, uh, let's say, 2000 MB per second. Whereas a DRAM uh, could do it up to 20,000 MB per uh, second. So with the capabilities of RAM being fast, do we have any shortcomings with memory? Uh, to identify a few, uh, the two areas we would need to look upon is uh, the limited capacity to address. So basically, uh, we do not have uh, the liberty of unlimited space when it comes to uh, uh, RAM. And if you have a single server uh, resource, that may not lead to uh, data reliability. So essentially what I'm saying here is if you would want to store large volumes of data, you might be confined to the limited capacity of address and you might, have, you might run out of space. At the same time, uh, there is a chance that uh, the server machines where your memory is uh, structured, it might go down and it might uh, lead to a single point of failure. So now let's see what IMDG brings to the table. So how are we going to uh, capitalize on the features of being in memory and how are we going to overcome the shortcomings? So I could go ahead and do a vertical scaling. So I could have one TB of memory uh, in order to increase the address space to store uh, data. Uh, so that could be one solution now that memory has become affordable. So the DRAM costs have gone down by like 30% uh, every uh, 12 months. Uh, but it's still a single point of failure if you're going to have only one single piece of server infrastructure. How about we do uh, horizontal scaling? So we have uh, multiple in-memory instances hosted across our commodity hardware where um, theoretically 
they would expand to infinite space of uh, memory uh, storage. So what exactly is the commodity hardware? So commodity hardware is an average set of computing resources that forms a server architecture and production systems. So ideally, uh, we do not need to deal with supercomputers to solve or process large amounts of uh, data. Okay, now that we have uh, horizontal scaling in place within memory instances, uh, one thing they would need to do well is to communicate among themselves across the network. So to aid this, uh, the network has got better and faster over the years. So you would hardly see a latency while transferring data or sharing data across uh, the nodes or the in-memory nodes. To sum it up, being in memory, I am able to scale up or down. I am able to add new nodes, increase the capacity, thus avoiding a single point of failure. And in case I need to shut down some of my nodes, I can seamlessly do that without loss of any functionality. So all said and done, I have a working server infrastructure using IMDG. How about the interfacing? As an application developer, how easy is it for me to interact with the data that resides in the IMDG? So IMDG provides you a map-like uh, data structure. So it is essentially a distributed hash map across all these uh, in-memory instances. Uh, so the map generally has key values and uh, from a querying perspective, it's an uh, ideal way to deal with uh, data. So how is the data stored? So are we constrained to RDBMS-like structure where you have a rigid schema where you store uh, data that, con that is confined to the data types of a table? Uh, not exactly. So here we have the uh, flexibility to store uh, keys and values as domain objects. So the, this avoids us the uh, process of marshalling and demarshalling from a database table object to our business object. So essentially I'm eliminating OR mapping and I'm dealing directly with the business object. So in traditional uh, systems, when we have to deal with large data sets, uh, the RDBMS uh, deals with a lot of file I.O. And since it's uh, relatively slower, uh, these processing operations are pushed to a batch mode. So the batch mode runs at a regular intervals or at fixed intervals, and this would effectively have the business decision to the customer only at fixed intervals. So with being in memory, we are able to process faster with larger data sets and give a faster response time to the uh, business. So next, uh, I would just list out the Java IMDG products that are available in the market. Some of them are open source with commercial features. Some others are uh, completely commercial. To start with, we have Gigaspaces, Hazelcast, IBM Extreme, JBoss InfiniSpan, Oracle Coherence, Terracotta, and Pivotal Gemfire. Uh, so I would be explaining the key architectural concepts uh, based on some of uh, the implementations from these products. Uh, we have a spec for uh, Java IMDG uh, implementation, that is JSR 347, and JBoss InfiniSpan is the reference implementation. So we would be uh, quoting most of our examples, uh, if not all, uh, from them. So what are the key architectural concepts behind the working of an IMDG? So firstly, uh, it is peer-to-peer -peer, uh, communication and not a master-slave uh, 
communication between the nodes in an IMDG. So now that we have the nodes in place with in memory, they would need to detect each other. As in, if a new node joins, I should be in a position to detect it as part of my uh, data grid network, share data, and the data should be up and running to process uh, requests. So how does the discovery happen? Uh, so in case of InfiniSpan, it works in two uh, modes. One is either it can be embedded directly into the JVM or you could host them as remote instances uh, in a grid-like, in a cluster-like uh, network. So InfiniSpan makes use of uh, JGroup's messaging model wherein multicast messages are sent across and whenever a new node joins, would send across this message and the other uh, nodes are able to discover and connect to them. How about uh, when a node goes down? So how do you detect? Uh, so we have a point-to-point -point heartbeat uh, mechanism wherein uh, if the adjacent nodes are not uh, giving out heartbeats, uh, then quickly we swarm the uh, network with messages to check, multicast messages to check if uh, all the nodes are alive. So based on the number of nodes that respond, uh, the load is uh, distributed and this is how uh, recovery uh, takes place in case of an IMDG. So how is data stored in an IMDG? Uh, so do we end up storing all the data in all the nodes or only in some nodes. Uh, so there are two uh, main differentiations among uh, data storage. Uh, one would be uh, replication wherein uh, each object in each node is also present in each and every other node in the cluster. So what this does is uh, high availability as a result of which uh, any read operation uh, becomes local to that node and hence the performance is high for read. Whereas in case of a write, I would need to push the update to each and every node. So this uh, could be a costly operation. So in order to overcome this, InfiniSpan uh, tries to send uh, UDP multicast messages whereas a single broadcast is good enough to send an update to all the nodes. So what is the other way of dealing with uh, data storage? So we could have it distributed, uh, wherein uh, you could have a single node with a backup node and both of them being owner nodes for a set of uh, data. So this way, uh, whenever one of the nodes goes down, you could quickly recover by the data from the backup uh, node. So there is no master-slave relationship. However, all I'm trying to say here is the data may be distributed across uh, one or two backup uh, nodes, but all of them are equal when it comes to handling uh, requests. So let me just uh, revisit the slide again. As you can see, uh, the first row talks about a uh, partitioned uh, space wherein uh, the data is unique to that particular uh, node and not shared across others. So this is essentially how some of our uh, traditional uh, RDBMS systems have data in them. So they do not have any kind of replication. Uh, then you could see uh, the second row wherein data is replicated across primary and the backup. And the third mode uh, would be where data is replicated across each and every node in the cluster. So one interesting thing I would like to touch upon is, uh, so now that we have multiple object entries, how do we find out or how do we distribute them in a load balanced manner across multiple cache machines. So let's assume I have 10 object entries and I have three cache machines. 
So the best way or the fastest way to do it is uh, using a hash function by using a modulus operator. So when you have 10 object entries and do a modulus of 3, uh, so whatever the remainder becomes your uh, cache machine. Now this works well until a point of time when the number of machines is either increased or decreased. So basically um, the initial 10 object entries that were being cached in three machines, let's say uh, need to be cached in six machines. So now all of a sudden since the output of this hash function has been altered, so all the object entries need to be rehashed to new cache locations. So as a result of this, the old cache entries are invalidated and this results in a swarm of messages to the cache machines. So what is the best way or one of the ways uh, to handle this situation? So in such cases, we could go for consistent hashing. So assume that uh, the machines are uh, placed in kind of a ring formation. Um, so in the diagram that we see in the current slide, let's say we have three cache machines, A, B, and C, and we have uh, four object entries. So the hash function would be same for both the object entry as well as the cache machine. So the hash function on the cache machine leads to a interval to which the object's hash code would map. So ideally what we would be picking is uh, the next available cache machine in the ring. So one would be placed in machine A two would be in uh, cache B, three in C, and four again would be placed in A. So now what if C goes down and uh, we have a new node D that comes up? So we should be having the least impact to the object entries that are cached already. So three would actually go on to sit in D and uh, four would sit in uh, D as well. So we can see uneven distribution of cache machines. So in order to solve this, we use a concept called virtual nodes, where each slice of the wheel is shared equally across all the available cache machines. So moving on, so the way we deal with RDBMS systems is we have a rigid schema and the data is constrained by uh, the data types or the structure of the table and we generally have uh, constraints across the tables to have a rigid uh, structure in place for the data. However, in case of IMDG, we deal with key value pairs uh, which could hold domain objects. So since they are schema-less, uh, we could store any kind of business objects in them. So adjacent rows might actually end up having different business objects. And uh, as an application developer, uh, I would have the knowledge of interacting with these objects. So one of the key functions uh, we would be dealing with IMDG is querying. Uh, so we may not essentially query only based on the key. So there might be a case where I would need to query based on the attributes of the value as well. So InfiniSpan uh, goes ahead and makes use of uh, Hibernate search along with Apache Lucene to do the querying bit. So Hibernate search would generate uh, document-like structures on which Apache Lucene would uh, index. Uh, something like a pivotal gem fire could give you SQL-like functions or object querying. So in case of object querying, uh, it may not exactly do all that an SQL uh, does, something like an aggregate uh, function, but uh, I could parse through complex uh, object structures using object uh, querying. 
So how about transaction uh, support in case of uh, IMDG? Uh, so ultimately my data has to be consistent in the in memory instances that are hosted in the cluster. Uh, so one of the ways of uh, actually achieving this is through two-phase uh, commit. So the underlying uh, locking mechanism to achieve this uh, depends on uh, the scenarios. So InfiniSpan makes use of uh, uh, optimistic strategy as the default, wherein uh, you retrieve the row without the lock you modify the row and if uh, none of the participating uh, nodes get to a commit, you acquire the lock and then go ahead and commit. Whereas in case of a pessimistic uh, strategy, you retrieve the lock on the row up front, modify the row and commit. So in case of pessimistic, the duration of the lock is longer, so as a result, uh, the weight operations by other transactions would be uh, more. So when do I get to choose uh, which one is better for me? So we generally go for an optimistic uh, strategy uh, whenever uh, we deal or we modify data that is spread across multiple rows. Uh, whereas we go for a pessimistic strategy if there is sameness in the data uh, working on the same domain objects. So another uh, key concept <coughs> I would like to touch upon is uh, serialization. Uh, so even though we directly deal with data in memory and not the disk, we would need to transfer data across the network as well as between the peers. Uh, so either we could have uh, the data back to a traditional RDBMS, which is not uh, mandatory, but it could be used as a backup store. Uh, serialization and deserialization de would uh, come into picture. Uh, so the way uh, InfiniSpan uh, does it is, it generally has magic numbers for the default data types which InfiniSpan identifies. And at the same time, uh, it also lets the application developer write externalizers in order to come up with magic numbers for uh, their custom uh, objects. So what is the whole purpose of using these magic numbers? Uh, so in case of Java serialization, which is quite slow, uh, and it generates multiple bytes, so these multiple bytes would need to be transferred across the network. Uh, in order to overcome this, uh, the magic number mechanism generally uh, deals with maybe a single byte uh, transfer across the uh, network. So in case of pivotal gem fire, they use a concept called as portable data exchange uh, for serialization. So different uh, implementations have their own uh, way of transferring data across the uh, network. So last but not the least, uh, I would like to touch upon uh, where the logic resides in case of IMDG. In case of traditional uh, RDBMS systems, uh, we generally get uh, most of the data and process it in our code. Uh, as the data size increases, uh, this leads to a lot of uh, network communication, serialization, deserialization, as mentioned already. Whereas in case of IMDG, uh, the logic to process the code is present in the in-memory instance. So each in-memory instance can do the processing, kind of a map reduce, and basically arrive at the merged results from each of the uh, instances. So in a well-formed IMDG topology, uh, the data transfer across is kept at minimal and each operation is uh, as good as a local operation. So these were the, some of the key architectural concepts behind the working of an IMDG. So that's pretty much uh, what I had. So Sharat Reddy would be continuing with a quick demo. So you get to see how to actually use it in person.
All right, so it's demo time. All right, so what I have here is as uh, um, Pratik already mentioned, uh, we had uh, chosen InfiniSpan as our, uh, um, uh, to perform a demo as well as uh, uh, we, we refer to uh, InfiniSpan in most of our presentation. Uh, <clears throat> we have chosen Infini InfiniSpan for the demo as well. So what I have is a de uh, default uh, InfiniSpan uh, setup here. I haven't changed much here, just to keep it simple. We are going to be demonstrating uh, a simple uh, 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 a cache which holds vehicles in it. And uh, we would also eventually uh, show you um, querying um, uh, capabilities of uh, InfiniSpan and uh, uh, a little bit of uh, um, uh, map reduce in, in in terms of distributed queries. All right. So basically, what we have here uh, is a cache called vehicles, and uh, um, I have also enabled uh, GMX statistics, so we uh, so we will be able to see uh, the behavior of the cache and uh, various other concepts that uh, Pratik touched upon in terms of rebalancing and uh, uh, you know the, how uh, entries are uh, distributed across the ca across the cache. So basically, uh, to start off with, I'll show you the domain object. All right, to start off with, uh, we'll show you the domain object that uh, was created for the purpose of the demo. So this is a, a vehicle that we have, which has uh, a simple make, model, and price. I have the key here to uh, show you that the results that we get out of the query is unique. And that is for a later point in time. And basically, I have a two-string implementation also for it uh, to be able to see the results of the query uh, in a more meaningful way. And I have I have something called a cache populator, where, uh, which is basically responsible for populating the cache uh, up front uh, to be able, as you as you can see, just uh, all that it does is a put. Uh, Pratik mentioned earlier that uh, um, IMDGs uh, provide you a simple interface. Uh, a map-like interface where you could just do all you uh, have to do is just do a get or a put, uh, like you do with a map. All right. To start, we have, I'll run the cache populator, so I'll uh, bring up the cache as well as populate it. All right. So now I've brought up the cache. I'll uh, show you the cache statistics in one of the JCons so we can see. Uh, so basically, InfiniSpan also exposes uh, a few JMX beans using which you can uh, look at the statistics at any point in time of uh, all the nodes in the cluster. For example, I'm looking at a specific node that I've just about started. There's just one node, and uh, the default setting of Infin InfiniSpan is to have uh, uh, the replication count set to two, which means that uh, there will be backup of each node into other nodes, uh, just in case uh, if the ca if uh, if a particular node has to go down, uh, we we can always use the uh, backup that was replicated across uh, two other nodes. All right, so there are. Uh, 1,063 elements or uh, number of uh, vehicles in this cache as of now. There's just one node as of now. We will start uh, a few more um, to show you. So I'll start just one other node to show you that uh, if there are just two nodes in the cluster and the replication count is set to two, it would uh, actually mean that you are running the cache in the replication mode. So there were two modes that uh, Pratik touched upon earlier. One is replication mode, which is what we usually do with our uh, normal caching uh, uh, solutions like EH cache. We basically uh, replicate every entry in every node in the cluster. Uh, so as of now, since there are only two uh, nodes running, you could see that the number of cache entries won't change much. It would remain one uh, 1,063 because the 
data is replicated in both the nodes. It is currently in the replication. It's running in the replication mode. You will however see the difference when you introduce a few more nodes in the cache. So one other thing that we'll have to note here is that we spoke about discovery uh, earlier and uh, uh, InfiniSpan uh, using JGroups in order to perform a discovery and uh, uh, perform rebalancing when required. So as you can see, uh, two nodes have already been discovered here and they have already been made, made the part of uh, the cluster. Right? You, you could see here it says receive new cluster view and there are two nodes listed down here. Right? Now when I add another node, to the cluster, you could see that there are three nodes identified now, and all three have become part of the cluster automatically without you have to doing you having to do anything at all. So uh, now that we have three nodes, how does the balancing look? How does the number of entries in the cache look? As you can see, the number of entries in the first node that started up the cache has reduced to 697. All right. So the rest of the entries were distributed across the other two nodes, and uh, this node will also replicate a few entries from the other two caches as well. Now, moving ahead, I'll just uh, all right. So. This is about the discovery and uh, the cache part of it and replication as, uh, as well. What I'm going to show you is uh, uh, one of the most important aspect of uh, IMDG which is uh, uh, taking the uh, code to the data rather than bringing in data to the code. So that is one of the important aspects that uh, Pratik touched upon uh, towards the end of the session, um, MapReduce, which was to uh, take the algorithm to the data rather than bring the data to the algorithm. So what, what we are going to, we are not going to see exactly how uh, uh, an exact implementation of MapReduce, but a slight variation of it by means of uh, clustered queries. That is something that has, uh, that was recently introduced on onto InfiniSpan. Uh, I guess after five, uh, version five of InfiniSpan, uh, it was introduced. So what we are using is version six of InfiniSpan. I will show you the simple query that we have. Uh, so as you can see here, all that I have to do is get the cache and uh, get the search manager uh, for that particular cache and build a query. A query here, uh, I'm basically using Lucene for uh, performing the query. I'm using Lucene uh, query here. So I would uh, be able to get the query builder from the search manager and uh, for a particular class, uh, be advised that this particular class has to be indexed for Lucene to work. So I have also enabled indexing on vehicle by means of a uh, annotation. All right. So uh, moving on, I have built a query which says that I want to query all vehicles whose model matches Yukon. It's like performing uh, a starts with on uh, this particular text called Yukon. So I'm basically looking at vehicles whose model, uh, whose model matches uh, Yukon. All right, and then uh, I just uh, perform the query and get the iterator and uh, print them out. I could also simply get a list out of the result and print them out, or iterate them if you want to perform something specific on the individual results that you get out of the query. Uh, running the query. Running the query simply uh, would, all right, so now that you see I have run the query and uh, um, it has resulted in a few results and if you, as you can see all of these have uh, U coordinate as a model or U con Excel, it's like the starts with as I mentioned earlier. All right, so what, what, what this has done now is, uh, what we have done rather is uh, that we have performed a local query on a particular node, which means that whoever receives the query, the query is run on his own cache and the results are got out of that particular node alone. Now this isn't map reduce. this is like you are querying a particular node to get the data out of that node. Now 
if I have to query this across all the nodes and get the data from all the nodes, all I have to do is do this. Right? Instead of doing a get query, all I have to do is just do a get cluster query. So what this would do is it would result in a in firing a distributed query across all the nodes and uh, the results are collated at the end of it before uh, sending it to the uh, originator of the request. So I'm not going to run it because I'll have to rebuild the, the application in order to be able to show it. But the, query, the results would uh, look uh, more or less similar. You will see more results than you have seen on the screen right now. All right, so moving on. So that, that was the demo. We'll move on to a couple of uh, uh, slides which talk about uh, comparisons of uh, IMDG with uh, NoSQL and cache. We can just quickly skip through these uh, and uh, open up the session for question and uh, Q&A. Now, how does IMDG uh, compare with NoSQL? Now, uh, NoSQL and IMDG are like our technologies. Uh, I mean, uh, they have both uh, rapidly uh, uh, got uh, gained popularity in the market, and they both uh, have. Uh, uh, I mean, they both overlap in terms of technology because they uh, are more or less uh, doing similar things in uh, uh, in nature. For example, both NoSQL and uh, IMDG is transactional for that matter. Uh, the only difference being that uh, IMDGs can be can be using a, a two-phase commit uh, 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 transaction, whereas uh, um, yeah, so uh, whereas the NoSQL has to be eventually consistent. Now, then uh, the next point that we touch upon is uh, NoSQL and uh, IMDG have. Uh, uh, perform similar in nature when uh, it comes to write speeds, but reads are much faster when uh, in IMDG as compared to uh, NoSQL. That is that comes from the fact that it is uh, IMDG is in memory and uh, um, writes uh, read speeds are going to be considerably faster from uh, RAM than from the permanent storage or from the disk. The other the thing is, uh, no sequels have to be. I mean, uh, sorry, the data, data consistency is concerned. No sequels have to be eventually consistent at, at some point in time, but uh, IMDGs don't need to be. They could just be uh, uh, a simple transaction like a two uh, two phase commit, and that should do. Moving on to how uh, IMDGs compare with cache. Uh, IMDGs are nothing but an evolved version of a cache. We had cache earlier, which used to uh, be uh, in memory too. Uh, and ES, ES cache for, uh, is, a, is a good example for that matter. Caches were uh, running from uh, memory and the read speeds and uh, uh, response times and all that benefits that you used to uh, get from cache, we get the same benefits from uh, IMDG as well for the fact that they are both uh, in memory. And uh, uh, the difference being that IMDG uh, can handle much larger data and is distributed by nature. Uh, caches are not. Caches are not distributed by nature. Caches have to be made distributed through some other means. And that is why we have IMDG for that matter. Uh, and uh, the other thing that IMDG brings is uh, right behind and right throughs. That these things are not something that we associate with uh, caches because we don't use caches. Uh, uh, I mean, we don't use caches for the purpose of writing into the permanent storage or the secondary storage. So. Uh, IMDGs provide you capabilities such as uh, write-throughs which is synchronous in nature uh, uh, where uh, an update to the cache makes sure that the update also happens in the uh, the underlying RDBMS or the file store or whatever the storage is or write behind for that matter which is uh, asynchronous in nature where the writes happen at a later point in time asynchronously um, and updates the uh, RDBMS or the file store. Now that is how this uh, uh, IMDG compares with the uh, cache. Uh, now, what are the what are the factors that you will that that you will have to uh, uh, that, that influence you to choose on a solution an IMDG solution? What are the things that you have to look at before you choose a solution? Uh, these are the main uh, things that uh, 
uh, you could look at before choosing a solution. One is the eviction policy. There are uh, a few eviction policies that are very well known that were, that that most of you are aware of. Uh, where uh, whoever has used the cash for that matter, LRUs and uh, things like that. There are uh, other uh, eviction policies like uh, LIRS that have been introduced in uh, Infinispan or other uh, uh, IMDG uh, vendors. The other thing that you have to uh, um, uh, factor in is how good are the preloading techniques in the cash. Now preloading is a term that is used to uh, load up the cache, start up the cache with data loaded into it before the application starts or the request to the uh, cache come in. Now how good are the preloading techniques in the solution that you've chosen? And how good is the concurrent repartitioning? Now uh, Pratik spoke about uh, 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 rebalancing uh, when a node has added or removed into the cluster. How, how well does it uh, perform uh, that kind of uh, uh, repartitioning concurrently? And what is the memory footprint of this particular solution that you've chosen is also a, a very important uh, uh, thing to factor in. And the querying capabilities, of course. Uh, Pratik mentioned about uh, solutions, uh, IMDG solutions, which have uh, SQL-like querying capabilities. Grid gain is an example which provides you in a SQL uh, uh, style uh, querying capabilities. OQL is a very popular uh, uh, querying mechanism. InfiniSpan uh, supports Lucene, and it also has its own uh, DSL for querying. So there could be proprietary solutions for query capabilities. It is up to you as uh, to uh, uh, what solution you choose based on what is maybe the ease of use or the capabilities of the querying uh, uh, DSL. Now that brings us uh, uh, almost to the end of the session. Uh, so this slide just talks about uh, uh, what are the usages of this uh, of an IMDG. Uh, uh, so you could uh, just have a look at the slide which just speaks about risk analytics, trading, trading systems, bioinformatics, e-commerce, online gaming, and things like that. There could be many, many, uh, much more uh, such usages uh, uh, that could come in. All right, so that brings us uh, to the end of the session. Um, so we now open for uh, Q and A. Thanks for the insightful presentation. Uh, let's quickly take up the questions now. I request you to read out the questions and their answers so that all our users may listen to your insights. Sure. All right, so the first question is, can you provide use cases with examples on where we can use IMDG? All right, so this question was from Naveen SR. All right, so uh, most, mostly we use IMDGs. Uh, we could use a cache uh, in most cases. Now, why would I, why would I use an IMDG uh, to elaborate that question? Why would I use an IMDG versus uh, a cache, for example? A cache is used to uh, avoid disk reads uh, uh, and the latency associated with it. Now, I use a cache to speed up the process, uh, keep the results of the query, for example, in the cache. I would use the IMDGs also for this, uh, for more or less the same reason, um, except that it differs. IMDG differs from the cache in a way that uh, IMDGs can handle much larger amounts of data than a cache, and they are distributed in nature, which which means that you uh, always reach a particular. Uh, it is also uh, we also spoke about it being uh, uh, you, I mean you being able to take algorithm to the data, so uh, you don't have to transfer a large amount of data from a cache to the node which is running the algorithm and then perform whatever that is that you have to perform filtering or uh, uh, whatever that is searching for that matter or uh, uh, aggregating uh, you would not have to do that in the nodes that is that receives the request for example you could always take it to the data so the algorithm is always going to be smaller than the amount of data that we are uh, talking about so um, we could uh, have it done much faster so the latency is something that uh, could come in and uh, that, that's about it I guess. Uh, Alright, so we take the next question from Sridhar S. In slide 11, did you mean we can do parallel querying and get different set, different set of results without any delay? That's right, the query is parallel. Uh, when you say, uh, uh, I guess you're talking about uh, uh, yeah, so the query, when I perform query, and when I'm, uh, uh, this this query that uh, slide 11 spoke about, 
simple queries are generally local in nature. They, they uh, hit a particular node and uh, get the result from that particular node. Now, when I am talking about, uh, uh, when I'm talking about distributed queries, they are parallel in nature. Now that is what usually uh, what you would usually do uh, fire a distributed query and uh, we, we spoke about uh, uh, vehicle for that matter now, uh, a particular uh, vehicle for example Yukon is what we took as an example for a model that vehicle could be spread across or scattered across multiple nodes now I when I'm performing a search I will want to get all the results that match my criteria not from a single node but from across all the nodes in the cluster so I would want to fire a distributed query and I and they yes they run in parallel and uh, are distributed in nature. I hope that answers your question Sridhar. Alright so the next question is from Banu Prakash Kantala. Is the architecture similar to that of Hadoop except that this is a bigger RAM on each node? Well uh, Hadoop is not in memory it is file based now uh, that is where the major difference comes in Hadoop uh, is not in memory and IMDGs are in memory by nature so uh, you, would use, you would use Hadoop in cases when the time it takes to perform a particular operation Hello. All right, so um, I was uh, mentioning that Hadoop is basically used in scenarios where you don't bother about how uh, uh, time consuming a particular job or a, or a batch could be uh, for that matter. And IMDG in, in cases when, when latency is a matter that you worry about and uh, you want quicker response times. Now the architecture would be slightly different from that of Hadoop. Now the next question comes from Mahesh Avula. How is this different from Berkeley Cache from Oracle? Berkeley uh, seems to be a, just a DB. It's not a yeah. I mean, if you if you are talking about uh, the database, Berkeley I know as far as the database is concerned, uh, it, it the differences are similar to what we spoke about uh, with NoSQL or any other RDBMS that uh, Pratik spoke about. They are primarily uh, a persistent uh, uh, mechanism. They, they just like uh, NoSQL where the uh, model is a key value uh, unlike uh, any other uh, relational database management system. Right? They are, it is again yeah, not uh, in memory I guess. Right. If, if if you want to compare IMDG, uh, I mean, if, if there's a comparable product to InfiniSpan is uh, coherence that uh, Pratik spoke about. Uh, databases are not something that we usually compare IMDGs with because uh, IMDGs usually complement a database by uh, making uh, database transactions or much faster. Let's take up the next question. This is from Sridhar S. Yes. When a new node is introduced, do you mean to say that the new node will get a copy of all data of previously available old nodes automatically into its memory? Not all, uh, when, uh, when a new node is added, it would get the data only from the, not from all the uh, previously, available, not all, from all the nodes, but if it gets from all the nodes, what would happen is a redistribution from all the nodes have to happen, which means it would be, uh, the, uh, if you remember, Pratik took uh, 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 mentioned about consistent hashing. The major benefit of using consistent, ha consistent hashing is that you will not have to rearrange all the data from all the nodes in the cluster. That is the that is the most important benefit that comes out of consistent hashing. All the, uh, only those if a particular node is added, it would get placed in the ring somewhere, and only the nodes that are nearest to it uh, will get the, uh, will, I mean the redistribution will occur only on the data that is uh, located closer to the node uh, in the ring. You, if you remember the ring that Pratik showed, that, that, is, that is the ring that I am referring to. So if a node gets added to a part of the ring somewhere, um, the closest node or the nodes, a closest a couple of nodes are the ones that will 
uh, get rearranged and uh, replicated as well. Right. Now this happens only during the uh, when the cache is in the partition or the distributed mode, not in the replicated mode. In case of the replicated mode, you are right. All the nodes will have all the data, and a node being added will get all the data from the from a suggestion node, from the nearest node. All right. <clears throat> Let's take the next question from uh, Manthan Prakash. What's the storage type? Like in NoSQL, we have column we have column family for Cassandra and JSON for MongoDB, etc. Now, as uh, Pratik mentioned, uh, for uh, IMDGs, most IMDGs, uh, it is a map-like interface. It is a it is just a key value uh, where value can be any of your domain objects, right? except uh, Hazelcast which provides you with additional uh, other collections but uh, predominantly it is mapped across IMDG solutions that are available. Now even uh, I mean NoSQL and other uh, uh, in-memory or uh, uh, data, NoSQL databases uh, have their own uh, mechanisms of storing data. Alright so Alright, so this is a question that comes from Mayank Jori. In an era of cloud computing, why should we choose IMDG to say Amazon Elastic Cash? Alright, so Amazon Elastic Cash is something that uh, uh, we are not aware of or we have not come across, but uh, the idea of uh, IMDG is that it can make use of uh, clouds. Uh, I hope Elastic Cache also makes use of uh, um, clouds uh, and can uh, um, you know make use of uh, the hardware or the make use of the uh, computing capabilities that are available in the cloud dynamically. Uh, um, uh, like when you, uh, you you can, for example, add or remove a particular uh, node from a cloud, for example dynamically and uh, your IMDGs can immediately adapt to it and uh, scale up or down dynamically. Now that is something that could come with an IMDG uh, solution and I'm, I, I'm assuming that uh, Amazon Elastic Cache also does more or less the same thing. Alright, so the next question that comes uh, is from Kirti Sagar. Uh, what are the minimum system requirements for IMDG setup? For example, IMDG cluster or in any system we can implement IMDG like my laptop. Yeah, you, as I said, demo from my machine. Uh, you could also, if you could remember, uh, Pratik also mentioned about uh, commodity hardware or uh, you know uh, also a concept of uh, having any uh, uh, any node with uh, even uh, a little uh, computing capabilities. Uh, cluster together to form a, a, a data grid, a memory data grid. So it could, yeah, yeah you could actually use, make use of uh, 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 most uh, uh, or uh, available server infrastructures uh, to be able to set up an IMDG. Alright, due to time constraint, uh, I would request you to take the unanswered questions offline, which I will share with you through email. So if you would like to take one last question and uh, then sum up the session for today, you can do it now. Alright, so uh, we'll take uh, just one question from Vivek Desai. Would you say the ideal scenario would be to use IMDG in conjunction with RDBMS? Yes, we could. Uh, uh, that could be an ideal uh, scenario. Uh, we could use uh, IMDG as uh, the cache, uh, uh, which distributed cache uh, uh, with an underlying RDBMS, which could eventually uh, be the data store, which would store the data permanently. Now, if you would like to sum up the session for today. All right. So I guess we're done with. Yep, we are uh, we more, uh, we are we're done with the session. We'll take up the questions, uh, the rest of the questions that are uh, posted uh, offline. Um, and thanks for attending. Uh, that's about it from our side. All right, and.
I'm really thankful to our guest speakers for conducting this wonderful webinar. It was indeed a great session. I would also like to thank all our participants for their support in making this webinar a success. The recording of the webinar will be available on techgeek.com by tomorrow. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you Pratik. Thank you Sharath for all your time. Have a great evening ahead. Thank you. Too.